I'm Jonathan Stein. Welcome to a new video and podcast series brought to you by the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. We'll be speaking to young Goldman grads who are the next generation of leaders in their policy field and represent a diverse set of perspectives and voices within public policy. Who am I? I'm a civil rights attorney who focuses on voting rights, campaign finance reform, and redistricting, and other issues that determine whether our democracy is fully accessible and our governments are responsive to regular people. More importantly, though, I'm a proud Goldman graduate. So let's get started. Our guest today is Megan Garcia, head of New America California and a national security and cybersecurity expert. Megan, welcome. Thanks. It's great to be here. I want to talk about your career post Goldman. So right out of the Goldman School, yeah. you went to the Hewlett Foundation mm -hmm. to run the Nuclear Security and Nonproliferation Program. Right. Right. So in an interview that you did about that experience, mm -hmm. you mentioned that in your grant making you were really trying to direct the field to tackle new challenges. Yep. Tell us about the nuclear security field and where you think it needs to go. I started that in 2010. And at the time, this was right after the president had given a, a big speech about nuclear security and nonproliferation. So it felt like a big moment of opportunity in that field um, for a lot of policy change. But a lot of the organizations in that sector have basically been doing similar things for a long, long time. Mm. And I don't think this is unique to nuclear security or national security. I think it's kind of a, a big policy problem writ large. So part of my thinking as a funder was, how can I use the dollars that I have to incent new behavior that's actually going to be more effective? So some of that meant breaking people out of the same kind of habit of um, educating members of Congress in the same way they had for the past 30 years uh -huh. with the same kind of boring materials and the same people in the same way. Um, and I think where the field is going and really should go more is towards innovative practice to communicate about the subject matter. Because your average person doesn't really know a lot about nuclear weapons and they don't really make sense in, in terms of their day-to-day -day life. So right. what can we do to make them tangible, to make the issue interesting and engaging and kind of, you know, to the average person? Right, so as an example, I'm assuming what you're referring to is if you've been in Berkeley, the nuclear-free zone signs that are on yeah. every single street, that's right. the sort of innovative thinking I assume you're talking about, <laughs> right? Yeah, from the 60s. Right. Uh, maybe not, yeah. but, but thinking about, I mean, actually engaging people on this campus, that would be something that would be interesting and that I think the field hasn't done that well in a long time. Do you think that the presidential election uh, has renewed interest in nuclear policy because of some people's fears that yeah. perhaps one of the two candidates might be a dangerous person to be uh, Absolutely. controlling our nukes? Absolutely. And I think it's actually, it's kind of a classic policy situation where you don't see that coming, but you hope that the groups in the field that are working on the issue are ready to pounce when it does. A policy window. Yeah. That's a term I learned from Dean Brady. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So using that policy window, having everything ready to be able to take the opportunity to write in the New York Times or you know, be on popular TV or whatever the case may be. Right. So after running the nuclear security program at Hewlett, you moved to cybersecurity, right? So um, I, I know a ton of policy wonks, and I know um, that cybersecurity is a huge issue, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because the Chinese and the Russians appear to be hacking everything, and non-state actors are getting involved, maybe with state backing, we're not really sure. Right. And yet, despite knowing a ton of policy wonks and knowing that cybersecurity is important, I have no idea what a cybersecurity policy wonk looks like. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. I suppose I'm looking at one right now. Well, I think it's a new thing, right? Okay. Right. Like, I don't know that anyone really knows what they look like. Although, interestingly, if you take a bunch of social science research about computer science and the military and put it together, uh -huh. you can figure out that the average person would probably think that a cybersecurity expert was a young white man in a hoodie working by himself. Drinking Red Bull and coding overnight. Yes, yeah, that's pretty much it. your standard kind of right. computer science -y image. Right, right. If you add in the military aspect of cybersecurity, it gets even more masculine. Um, so I definitely am not probably the most <laughs> average looking cybersecurity expert, right. but I, I don't actually think there is one yet. It's uh -huh. such a new field, uh -huh. for sure. So as a woman in what I'm assuming are often male-dominated spaces, right, how do you deal with 
the isolation or the sense of marginalization that might creep in and I think sort of result in a certain amount of, um, it could result in a certain amount of insecurity about your place in that, in that field. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so I went to work on Capitol Hill in my early 20s and I yeah. think that kind of gave me, gave me some good practice. And so one of the things that I did at the time was um, to sort of play a game. So at the time I was working on national security, I was, you know, in my early 20s, I've always looked young, so I was not the most imposing person in the uh -huh. room. So I would play this game, especially when I was working with, you know, three or four star generals or people who are very intimidating, uh -huh. or especially at the time, where, you know, we would get together, we would sit around a table with a lot of members of Congress and, you know, pretty imposing people. Right. And I would think to myself, okay, at the beginning of this conversation, probably no one's gonna take what I have to say seriously. Let's see if at the end of the conversation that's true as well. Uh -huh. And so sort of, using people's lack of uh, sort of response to me at the beginning uh -huh. as fuel to figure out if I could come up with the most interesting and effective ideas and communicate them as well as I could. It still takes courage though, right? To, as oh, a 23 yeah. year old, to tell a four star general something new and interesting that he doesn't or she doesn't know before. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, being, especially in that context, in the military context, being hugely respectful is really, really important. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a, there's a good combination of respect and learning how to state your ideas. It's really, really important for women, especially young women, to learn. So uh, I want to talk about the substance of mm -hmm. cybersecurity, uh, particularly as it plays out sort of in the news and the headlines right now. Yeah. But before we get there, let's talk about the, your, the Women in Cybersecurity Initiative that you run at, at New America. Uh -huh. T tell us a little bit about what it does and how it's, it comes out of the experiences you've had as a, personally. Yeah, so let's see. So New America has a great cybersecurity initiative, which thinks about what you probably would imagine as a policy expert, cybersecurity folks would think about. So, you know, national and international legislation, um, technology, you know, et cetera, et cetera. One part of that is now the Women in Cybersecurity Project because um, Anne Marie Slaughter is our CEO. And as you probably know, she's now well known for thinking about women in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And we also had the cybersecurity initiative. Um, and people kept coming to us and saying, you know, you're working on women right. in various fields. You're working on cybersecurity. Why are you together. not doing that? Yeah, yeah. Especially given that um, the cybersecurity field is about 10% women, which wow. is really, really low. Even for tech, it's really, really low. So what we do in the Women in Cybersecurity Project is a couple things. One, we take the women who are already in the field mm -hmm. and try and raise their voices. So we have something called, um, Humans of Cybersecurity, which is on Twitter and Medium, which is all about just telling stories of people, right. diverse people in the right. field. You like know? Humans of New York. Yeah, exactly. Yep. That's the idea. Um, we have a slightly smaller audience, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we also, uh, you know, talk about policy solutions and solutions for businesses in the field who uh -huh. do want to bring more women in. Uh -huh. And it's an interesting moment, actually, because the field really, really wants more people. And given that they're not tapping women, they right. want more women. 50% of the workforce is not part of their business model. Right. Currently. So they need more people. It's, right. a, it's a huge problem. The field is making a lot of money. So we think it's a really good time to try and influence business to bring more women in. And so some of the things we talk about are, you know, really simple. For example, if you're a cybersecurity business or an information security business, look at your website. If it looks like you know, it's all a video game uh -huh. about killing people, uh -huh. you're probably not gonna attract a huge, yeah. you know, line of women in the, right. in the door to, you know, much more complicated changes, that, including, you know, culture change in a business or an organization, which is probably the, the highest level of, of difficulty. So we're on the topic of businesses recruiting the next generation, right, of people yeah. in the field. What advice do you have to a woman who's, let's say, starting at Goldman this fall, interested in national security, interested in international affairs, maybe cybersecurity specifically, yeah. but not sure if it's the field for her. Um, well, my time at Goldman was great for me because I used it as a way to experiment. So I came from the Hill, um, but I was trying to figure out, do I, did I wanna go back to DC, one? Do I wanna be in California, two? Do I still wanna work on national security, three? So my advice to anyone who's sort of asking similar questions of themselves when they start at Goldman is to use the time to really try out a bunch of things, whether that is different classes, classes inside Goldman, classes outside Goldman, and especially using the summers to, you know, go work in a new field, go work in a new office, go work in a new setting and figure out what really works for you. Um, generally speaking though, when I talk to young women who are interested in working in cybersecurity, I pretty much just say, give it a whirl. It is an incredibly 
fast growing industry right. is really lucrative. The median salary for anyone in the field is much, much higher than almost anywhere else right now. Yeah. So it's not gonna hurt you to give it a try. Right, okay. So let's talk about the substance of the policy area, right? So I, I just read that the, the Russians attempted to hack the New York Times. Right. Um, and it was widely, I think the wide consensus among cybersecurity experts was that the Russians were behind the DNC hack mm -hmm. that emerged right before the Democratic National Convention. And I read um, this week that the Russians were behind an attempted hack of the White House in 2014. Uh, and the White House's response was, look, the breaches were minor and they weren't a major problem. So yeah. three questions. One is, how can anyone hack the White House and it's not considered a, minor, a major problem? That's <laughs> one. Two is, are major state players just constantly hacking each other in the modern era and the public is just sort of not aware of that? And three, lots of questions here. Yeah. Three, what's going on with the Russians right now? So generally speaking, yes, state act, large state actors that have the capacity, so the United States, Russia, China, and a few others, are constantly hacking each other. Huh. So cybersecurity espionage and cybersecurity attacks are a common thing. That said, none of the rules of the road have been established. So lots of experts have sort of um, made the analogy that this period for cybersecurity is sort of, sort of like nuclear weapons in the 40s and 50s, before we had rules, before we had sort of, you know, the the Cold War policy stuff that, that dictated most of that era. Yeah. So we're, you know, I don't like this analogy, but the most common thing you'll hear is it's, it's like the Wild West, where it's sort of like everybody's trying things out and figuring out where the limits are. And so that's why I think you see things like the DNC hack and the White House hack, um, where, and more recently, the president actually sort of tested the waters with a statement about hacking back, which is a very... Uh, controversial idea that when a state actor may have hacked, let's use the Russia and the United States for example. So if Russia hacks the United States, we don't actually have a policy that says we're going to retaliate uh -huh. in part because cybersecurity is so difficult because attribution is hard. So it's really, really hard to say definitively it was definitely this person or this you know state actor that, that did the hacking. The articles on this always say individuals who may have been right. employed there's by the hedging. Russian government it's, or whatever. There's all right. this hedging, yeah. right. Yeah. And part of that is a technical problem, and part of that is a political choice. Mm. So I think um, what I envision happening over the, the next several years is, one, hopefully attribution will be, will be better, and that will just provide clarity to the field. Yeah. But either way, major governments who engage in this kind of activity are going to have to sort of set some rules of the road. Um, some either global policies or bilateral policies that say, okay, when you do X, we're gonna do Y, right, or right. we're not gonna do Y. Right. Um, otherwise, you can imagine escalation being a really big problem. So you said that people are trying to figure out where the limits are. Do you mean the technological limits, or do you mean sort of they wanna know how, they're trying to test how far they can push before incurring the wrath of I think it's perhaps both. a stronger power? It's both, right. So, so you can imagine, um, so there's a big rule in the nuclear world called no first use, um, so, you know, right. unless you use a nuclear weapon on us, we're probably, we're, or many countries say we'll never use a nuclear weapon against you. We don't really have that in cybersecurity. Uh -huh. So again, it's sort of figuring out those boundaries. It's kind of like toddlers, you know, testing the water. If I push, are you gonna push back? Right. If I do this, are you gonna do it back? And then part of it is I think, you know, we're in deeply political times. We have the US elections going on, Putin is grandstanding. Right. We've got a lot of disruption in China. All those things factor into the, you know, what governments say about hacks. So when I read a headline that says the Russians hacked the White House, it's more par for the course than maybe my first response. Yeah, I mean, I think the unfortunate thing is it depends on what they did, right? Yeah. And we don't know that. So one, you know, don't sell your house and move to Canada. Like, you know, we're, <laughs> we're not all, you know, right. in for it. But two, we don't actually know what that means. Right. Um, so it could be a lot of things. So the most important of my three questions, what is going on with the Russians? Oh, right. <laughs> I don't know that I'm the best person to answer that question. <laughs> I mean, I think there are a lot of really interesting parallels between what's going on in, in Russia, actually Russia and China and the United States in some very meta ways. And, and I don't mean economic, well, to a certain degree economically, but what I, mean, what I mean is leaders who really want to appear strong. Yeah. Um, and so in Russia, that may mean, you know, Putin riding bareback on horses. Um, in the United States, that may mean, you know, Donald Trump talking about how he, how he can single-handedly fix a lot of America's economic problems. In China, that looks like um, the government trying to deal with, you know, s sort of smaller scale political disruptions that it's not used to seeing. 
Um, but I think there is a common thread of, of governments trying to kind of get a handle on citizenry that's pretty unhappy. Right. So are non-state actors or are state actors the biggest threat in the world of cybersecurity, right? We have all the sort of yeah. anonymous and all these people who may or may not be employed back or backed by Russia or China or whatever. Yep. What it, Those entities may be, I don't know, less well-resourced, necess- I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you don't need to be well-resourced in order to be a, an effective hacker, but they, I'm assuming, are harder to track, to locate, yeah. and uh, to stop. So. So that's a great question, and I think it depends. Thank you so much. (laughs) I think it depends on what you mean by threat. So if you mean uh, disruption to a bank, yeah, or sort of like the kind of financial crime section of cybersecurity, or if you mean political disruption, or if you mean terrorism, those are all really different. Okay. Right. Break it down for us. So state actors are the best resourced, right? So they have more people, more power. Um, and probably a longer lasting impact. So on the political front, you can imagine them inflicting some pretty serious damage. That said, they also have more to lose. So you can also think about an anonymous or any of the other um, non-state actors doing things that probably a a state actor would just never consider doing. They've got nothing to lose. Yeah, exactly. Um, So I think in all three cases, it just sort of depends. If you're thinking about cybersecurity in terms of crime, so financial crime and crime, um, t- and terrorism and political damage. On the financial part, that's the part that your average person touches, right? So everyone who's had their social security number taken or somebody's tried to open a credit card in their name or someone's stolen a lot of money from them, that's where actually most people touch cybersecurity and it's it's a huge, huge problem. Yeah. Um, I think a part of the problem there is that the average person, as you've mentioned, doesn't really understand the problem and they definitely don't understand what their role is. So part of um, part of the thinking in the field is, okay, should the goal be to go after citizenry writ large and sort of think about what's called cyber hygiene, which I think is a terrible term, but like thinking about vaccination, right? If vaccination is an analogy. Um, Protecting yourself. From, right, what can we all do as a herd to okay. sort of make sure that we have the best security protocols to, to sort of minimize hacking. Uh-huh. So that's one idea. Uh-huh. That only works if everyone does it. Okay. So it's a shaky idea, and it potentially is gonna take a lot of resources. Another idea is, okay, maybe that's just too big. Maybe what we need to do instead is work on sort of the rules for political hacking and mm. you know what governments are doing. At least there, you know, I think especially as policy people, it feels kind of easier and safer to yeah. think about what are the rules. Like we're good at that, you know. Right. Um, so there's a lot of again, it's it's such a new field. There's a lot of questions about where do you even focus energy. Right. Right. So um, I, I want to move on from your work at Hewitt on cyber national security and cybersecurity to your work at New America now. But before we go, I have to hold your feet to the fire here <laughs> just a little bit. We ask the tough questions here, okay? okay? So the section of your LinkedIn profile about about your work at Hewlett yeah. describes you, in your words, as a thought leader. Okay. How do you explain that? <laughs> Describing oneself as a thought leader is pretty indefensible. Uh, jargon. Jargon. I mean, we all Just, know it and love it. What would your term be for a thought I, leader? This is my problem. If you, if I had an analog, I would use it. Yeah, it's the same with the term millennial. Yeah. Th- there is no good analog, so it's, we keep using this term that we all like hate. It's like a long sentence. Yeah. I think your your four plus years at Hewlett probably established you as a thought leader, right? I mean, Unclear. Just, I mean, yeah. I, yeah. Who knows? Fair enough. So <laughs> um, it did enough anyway to get you hired as the head of the new California office of the New America, of New America. Right. Period. Yep. Um, so day one, you're the head of this new entity. Yeah. Uh, wh- what is what is it like? Are you sitting in a big office, uh, you know, on Embarcadero somewhere in yeah. San Francisco by yourself? So luckily for me, we started out with a very Goldman approach, okay. which was, so day one was actually conceptualization. So I was really lucky to not inherit something and be able to build something from the ground up. So um, the story behind this is that when I was a Hewlett, one of my grantee organizations was New America. And so through that work, I got to know Anne-Marie Slaughter, who's mm-hmm, my current mm-hmm, boss. Mm-hmm. And she and I were both sort of confused as to why think tanks hadn't really modernized. So we know that the vast majority of Americans, unlike you know, policy geeks like ourselves don't actually like the word policy. They don't trust government as much as they used to. And yeah. if anything, they're they're less engaged, right? So thinking about that, why are the vast, vast majority of American think tanks, which are almost all situated in Washington, D.C., right. thinking exclusively about federal and international policy? It doesn't quite match up, right? So 
part of the job is thinking conceptually about what can New America as a you know relatively large American think tank do differently to try and engage people where they are. So that's like, you know, that's a one big question. And then the other big question from the beginning was, what does that look like in California? Yeah. What can we actually do here to engage people? So every page of the New America California website, I think, uses the word disruption at least once, <laughs> right? So, so jar, again, jargon. But, but yeah. it feels as though, as an institution, you're trying in some way to embody the region or embody mm -hmm. a, a particular, you know, sort of uh, segment of this region. Is yeah. that a conscious choice? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I think a huge part of what we're doing is serving a translation function. Mm. So if what New America does in Washington, D.C. is to think about the most innovative and hopefully effective solutions to policy problems, what we're trying to do in California is, one, translate some of that work into language um, that people here who are very, very far outside the Beltway and often feel disconnected from government might actually find engaging. Mm -hmm. Um, and then two, part of the experiment is to figure out if we work with a bunch of people who are actually making change and they're based in California and we tell their stories and we get them writing in Slate and on TV and doing whatever they're doing, are those stories actually going to motivate who we call the marginally engaged Californian to engage in civically in some way? So right. what I mean by that is somebody who might, you know, so we have lots of potential people like this. If you think about um, it could be a community college student in Fresno who's 24 and Hispanic, who maybe wants to do something in his community but doesn't quite know how. Mm -hmm. Or you have um, you know, a late 30s freelancer mom in San Francisco who maybe wants to do something in her community and doesn't know how, et cetera, et cetera. You can mm -hmm. imagine, right? So if we highlight these narratives of positive renewal that are actually happening here with real people, does it inspire other people uh -huh. to engage in some way? So that's kind of the biggest experiment what we're doing. Right. So how do you sell uh, thought leaders in the Bay Area, <laughs> yeah. right, sort of people who are leading in policy and tech and other fields in the Bay Area? This is an area famous for an emphasis on disruption, on constant evolution, on being at the cutting edge of thinking and technology. How do you sell them on the idea of a think tank, which is an awfully old-fashioned idea? Basically, we just sidestep it. So one, <laughs> we try not to call ourselves a think okay, tank. Okay. We use words that don't make sense sometimes, like okay. civic enterprise, and we're sort of figuring out the nomenclature. Got it. But I think, too, what we talk about is stories. So stories we know resonate with people. They're really fuzzy, and a lot of us have a hard time working with them and thinking about them because they don't yield regressions or other things that we can kind of get our hands around really easily. But we talk about stories. So. For example, um, one of our fellows who's a social entrepreneur is Mia Birdsong, who is trying to change what we think of as the ideal American family, especially for African American families, mm -hmm. away from the nuclear family. Mm -hmm. So embrace you know, big families, aunties, adopted parents, neighbors, whomever. Um, and what we do is try and tell her story effectively. Mm -hmm. So make sure that she's out there. She's gonna be hosting TED Women, which is in San Francisco. She's going to be actually doing forum with my boss, Anne-Marie Slaughter. So getting her story out there yeah. and, again, sort of figuring out if that resonates with people. Right. So how, how is a think tank and or civic enterprise <laughs> yeah. based in the Bay Area fundamentally different in the way it does business and the way it sells itself yeah. than a think tank in D.C. or New York? So this is, I think, the most exciting part of what we're doing. Um, is that all of the different, we call them hubs, all of the different hubs that New America has outside of DC, they're all pretty much designed in their own image. Uh -huh. So the idea is not, let's have cookie cutter, little tiny New Americas all around the country. It's what's really, really gonna resonate in that region and how can we experiment. They're designed in the image of their city or yes, the region, right? Yes, or the okay. region, right. So in California, what that means is to a certain degree, um, moving away from the word policy and uh -huh. moving away from talking about politics. So we know that lots and lots of people in California are very turned off by politics. And the, the further away you go, the more turned off they are, which is, not, is actually a pretty intuitive thing. Mm -hmm. So locally, people feel most connected. Federally, people feel least connected. So again, telling local stories, um, and sometimes that, that's about disruption in technology, and a lot of times it's about technology. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's about the Central Valley. Yeah, so we're about right. to do a big... Um, set of stories and interviews with actors in the Central Valley who are trying to shake things up. Uh -huh. um, so people who are changing the way ag is working, people who are changing the way um, civil services work, people who are thinking about young populations who maybe 
boomerang. So they start in the Central Valley, they may come out here and then go back to yeah, the Central Valley. Right. So again, tapping into, because it's such a huge and diverse state, what are all the different sort of ideas and stories that are related to policy problems that we can talk about? Yeah, that's awesome. So where can people find you and your work? Um, so New America is the easiest way. So okay. there's a New America website and there's New America California website. It's a great, great way to kind of check us out. Um, and then we have lots of online content. So last question, sure. what word do you use to refer to our generation? And uh, what I mean by that is, do you use millennial? Do you yeah. use something else? Do you identify as a millennial? I feel like we're a little bit older than most people who are yeah. typical millennials. I'm on the cusp. Yeah, so, so am I. So I'm either X or millennial, depending on which source you look at. Wasn't there a Y in between generation X and millennials? I don't know. These terms are meaningless. <laughs> They're meaningless. It's part of my point. I, I think what's important, though, yeah. is that people, I would say, in their mid-30s and younger, uh -huh. don't want to feel like they're part of a generation, right? Like, they don't want to feel like they're part of a big lump. Uh -huh. And I think some of that, unfortunately, is is consumerist, right? Like, we're all used to, I want my right. we want, we venti, want non-fat, yeah. whatever, whatever, with my name on Everything's it. Everything's customized to us. Yeah, yeah customization, crazy on, the, on sort of the product side. Yeah. And part of that is feeling like... I think, did some of those big generational changes yield what we want? Unclear. Right. Maybe that's not what's needed. Maybe it's us thinking differently. And I'm sure some of that is being based in the Bay Area where there's so much hyper focus on individualization right. and right. kind of making it big as, a, as an individual. Right. Um, but yeah, so I don't, I don't have a problem with the term millennial, mm. um, but I do think it's interesting that so many people do. Yeah, and no one uses it. What do you say? Like, how would you describe yourself? I just I basically say millennial, but not a millennial, maybe. Okay. There is no good term. That's the yeah. thing is there's no alternative think tank. There is no alternative to millennial. Yeah, yeah. And yet I just think it's a way that older generations sort of stereotype and scapegoat a younger generation yeah. that doesn't fit cultural or workplace norms that have existed for generations. And yet we're talking about it. It's really rich coming from a generation that is leaving us with a giant bill in terms of like debt and yeah climate change remediations that we're gonna to have to undertake because of policy choices they made, right? Yeah. It's like, we'll just define ourselves, thank you very much. You know what I mean? I think the workplace changes are actually gonna be the most interesting. So for me, for example, and this is related to GSBP. So when I came to Goldman, I was, as I mentioned, thinking, you know, do I wanna go back to DC, work in government? Do I wanna stay here? And now that I am so used to having so much autonomy, mm. I don't actually know if I could go back and, and sort of work as a cog I mean, that's a terrible representation. I'm sorry to all really of my is. colleagues. I'm um, <laughs> often a cog of my own kind, so I mean, thanks we're all so a much. Cog, so. But like, thinking about how much I prize autonomy yeah. and the ability to innovate, however I may define that, is yeah. so important to Such me. Such a millennial. I know, accidentally. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I, th I do think cultural change in the workplace is gonna be really huge over the next 20 years. Cool, yeah. thanks for joining us. Yeah. I appreciate it. Absolutely.